Good afternoon. Welcome to a virtual lecture brought to you by the Nanovig Institute for European Studies from the University of Notre Dame. My name is Clement Sedmark, and I'm the interim director of the Nanovig Institute. The Nanovig Institute's mission is quite simple, to bring Europe to Notre Dame and to bring Notre Dame to Europe. Because of this mission, we want to celebrate important European persons and important European dates. The year of 2020 is not only an exceptionally challenging year where we have to go through a pandemic, it is also the year of the 100th birthday of Pope St. John Paul II. John Paul II was born as Carlo Wittia on May 18, 20, um, 1920. His papacy had a deep and sustainable impact on Europe. It is safe to say that the pontificate of John Paul II changed the political and spiritual landscape of Europe. Because of this distinctive European dimension of St. John Paul II's life and impact, the Nanovic Institute decided to organize a special lecture honoring John Paul II and reflecting on his significance for Europe. The challenge of a lecture dedicated to a towering figure is simple. Who can do that? It has to be a person who has a deep understanding of the roots and the spiritual sources John Paul II was drawing from, a person with a wide intellectual horizon and a European perspective, ideally a moral and spiritual leader. Well, we were blessed and fortunate enough to have found such a person. We've approached him about this lecture and he generously agreed to give a virtual lecture for the Nanovic Institute, Father Mikhail Paluk. Father Paluk is the rector, the rector magnificus of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum in Rome. He's a Dominican priest and belongs to the province of Poland. Father Michal was born in 1967 in Poland. He studied at the Music Academy, then entered the novitiate, made his first religious profession of vows, studied philosophy and theology, completed a doctorate in uh, dogmatic theology at Fribourg, Switzerland, and then started a teaching career at the College of Philosophy and Theology in Krakow, where uh, then he served as director of the Thomistic Institute in Warsaw, and then he was the rector of the College of Philosophy and Theology in Krakow. And since 2014, he has been teaching at the Pontifical Faculty of Theology in Warsaw. And now he has been made the rector of the Angelicum in Rome. We very much wanted Father Mikhail to be with us in person here in Notre Dame. He has been here in the past. He has been a visiting scholar of the Nanovic Institute. And he has also been a visiting scholar of the McGrath Institute for Church Life. We will do our utmost best to get Father Mikhail back to campus. Father Mikhail, we are very honored that you are uh, virtually with us today. Thank you so much for your time. You're speaking to us from Rome. Thank you for spending part of your evening with us, providing us with a lecture entitled John Paul II's Proposal for Europe, a celebration of the past or a prophetic invitation for the future. Dear audience, thank you for joining us. Father Palok will lecture for about 40, 45 minutes. After that, we can ask some questions and make some comments. Please make use of the Q&A button for that. We will end on time at 1.45. Thank you so much, Father Rettore. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sedmak, for this invitation and as well for this kind and challenging introduction to, uh, to what uh, I want to present. In fact, it's true that, that I know Notre Dame and, uh, and its beauties. <laughs> and, uh, and I think with a lot of gratitude about your institution uh, during my second, uh, uh, second uh, possibility of, of being in uh, Notre Dame, I could use an office in the Nanobic Institute, thanks to Professor uh, McAdams. Uh, and it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to speak uh, to you tonight in Rome and today uh, for you uh, in Notre Dame uh, about John Paul II, uh, my compatriot and the most illustrious alumnus uh, of our university, the Pontifical University St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum, in, in which I happen to be the rector just now on the 100th anniversary of his birth. Let's start, let's start at the end of John Paul II's life 
in spite of the fact that the anniversary makes us think about its beginning. His life ended on the 2nd of April 2005. It was the Saturday evening before Law Sunday, the second Sunday of the Paschal time. Uh, it was difficult not to be struck by the moment of his death. One could have the impression that the moment of his death was offering as the key to the pontificate of Karol Wojtyla. John Paul II died on Saturday, that is to say, on the day which is, according to the tradition of the Catholic Church, devoted in a special way to Mary. The devotion to Mary had always been in the center of JP2's spirituality. It is not by chance that he chose for the motto of his pontificate, the famous slogan, Totus Tus, all yours, making a clear allusion to the spiritual approach of Louis de Montfort. But it is even more significant that John Paul II died after the beginning, the first Vespers, of the Law Sunday, the Feast of Divine Mercy. This feast had been introduced by himself in the aftermath of the canonization of Sister Faustina Kowalska, a Polish mystic who is known worldwide thanks to the devotion connected to the painting Jesus I Trust in You. The second element, the connection to the Feast of Divine Mercy, makes me think about a cluster of images that sum up the different phases of Wojtyla's life. I see him as a strong young man in a simple and worn out worker's uniform when, while working in the Solvay factory during the dark time of the Nazi occupation, he comes for a moment of prayer to the church close to the cemetery on which unknown at the time Sister Faustina was buried and which was close to the place of his work. I see an elderly but still strong Archbishop of Krakow coming to the same spot in order to pray while having difficulties with the approval of the devotion proposed by Faustina on the part of the Roman congregations. I finally also see the elderly and ill Bishop of Rome coming to the same place in order to consecrate with his shaking hands at that time the shrine of divine mercy. Wojtyla's life was really entangled with the mystery articulated by Faustina's life and celebrated on Law Sunday. Why do I start with all this? Let me explain it at the end of this paper. As you can guess, I want to suggest that it may throw light on John Paul II's proposal for Europe. But before we get there, my lecture will be organized in three parts. In the first one, I will try to present the core ideas and the core strategy of John Paul II's thinking about Europe. The second one will be focused on the main tactics he used in order to put his ideas and his core strategy into practice. As we all know, it is not only important what we think and what we want to do, but it is just as important, and sometimes more so, how we want to make something happen. The third part will deal with the question of the relevance of John Paul II's proposal for us today, as suggested by the subtitle of the lecture. I will try to undertake this, this final reflection by means of a brief and rough comparison of JP2's proposal for Europe with the dominant project. So let's start with the first part. The first two parts will be a little bit more tiresome, I guess, because I will try to remind you about several important texts, which will be the basis for, let's say, the final interpretation in the, in the last part. Let's start with the probably most famous passage on Europe by John Paul II, presented in his discourse delivered in Santiago di Compostela on the 9th of November, 1982. The core part reads as follows. I, 
Bishop of Rome and Shepherd of the Universal Church, from Santiago, utter to you, Europe of the ages, a cry full of love. Find yourself again. Be yourself. Discover your origins. Revive your roots. Return to, the, to those authentic values which made your history a glorious one and your presence so benef beneficent in the other continents. Rebuild your spiritual unity in a climate of complete respect for other religions and genuine liberties. Find yourself again, be yourself. How to understand these exhortations? Where do they lead us? There is no doubt that they should be read in the light of the core strategy of JP2's pontificate. This strategy has been described many times and it could be summed up briefly as an anthropological discussion leading to evangelization. Let me quote a less known passage from his first pilgrimage to Poland in 1979. Uh, it is probably the most simple pithy and even blatant example of how this strategy worked. For man cannot be fully understood without Christ, or rather man is incapable of understanding himself fully without Christ. He cannot understand who he is, nor what his true dignity is, nor what his vocation is, nor what his final end is. He cannot understand any of this without Christ. The Polish Pope kept putting this formula of arguing, so to say, in favor of Christianity into practice almost instinctively in many situations. It was inspired by number 22 of the Constitution Gaudium et Spes of the Vatican II, the text that he worked on during the Council, and that he knew almost by heart. Needless to say, one can find the same program in the first homily presented for the inauguration of his pontificate and in his first encyclical, Redemptor Homilies. If you read careful these passages, you will, you will discover that it is, it, is, it is the same strategy. It's the, the first one, the famous homily uh, for the beginning of his pontificate uh, contains the famous statement, do not be afraid, open wide the doors for Christ. And just afterwards, to be, do not be afraid, Christ knows what is in man. He alone knows it. And, and the same thing is about, you know, his uh, programmatic encyclical, I, uh, well, it's perhaps I, 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 I can uh, mentioned that, you know, on the 25th anniversary of his, of his pontificate, I, I made an exercise for myself. So, so I, I, I went back to the first encyclical and I was absolutely astonished at the fact how consistent he was. So, you know, he really started with a, with a program. He wrote down a program and, and after 25 years, you could, you could see how consistently he tried to put it, to put it into practice. So it's, it's a very important text and we'll come back for a moment later to it. If we take this core strategy into account, the meaning of the quoted passage from Santiago, Europe find yourself again, should be understood as follows. The peoples of Europe, you will be able to discover the depth and strength of your identities and flourish only if you discover Christ in the midst of your common history and project. This strong claim is accompanied sometimes by the convictions that, quote, it was evangelization which formed Europe giving birth to the civilization of its peoples and their cultures, and, quote, another quote, from apostolic times, the center of missionary outreach shifted to Europe, because, another quote, most non-European churches were established by missionaries who set out from Europe. 
It is also worth noting that reconstructing briefly the spiritual history of Europe, the Polish Pope looks for a helpful model for that in the St. Paul's meeting with the Athenians at the Areopagus, you know, Acts 17. As we remember, St. Paul starts his famous speech reminding his listeners about the altar to an unknown God that they had established in their beautiful city. The apostle wants his listeners to understand in such a way that he is just attempting to reveal to them what they have been worshipping without knowing it. Unfortunately, his efforts finally fail in spite of winning over for his cause the famous Dionysius the Areopagite with a few others. When Paul starts to mention the Paschal mystery, the, Athen the uh, Athenians conclude, we will hear you again about this and go away. John Paul II finds in this story a good basis to explain the dynamic of the evangelization in Europe. Evangelization in Europe started on the background prepared by the reflection on God of the pagan philosophers, so well known by the Athenians to whom Paul preached. But at the moment when, after many centuries, evangelization seemed to reach its maturity and its end, to get to the depths of the Paschal mystery, it started to be reversed by the opposite process, the rejection of Christ in the era of enlightenment. It is the real drama of this last phase that the rejection of Christ has been undertaken in the name of the very values which are profoundly rooted in the Christian tradition. These core claims regarding the identity and history of Europe found many articulations in different documents and speeches undertaken by John Paul II during his 27 year pontificate. They are a hard core, so to say, for the decisive lines of his pontificate. But before we try to look for some chosen hallmarks of the way in which John Paul II tried to put his thinking into practice, let me make two general observations concerning the core part of his message on Europe presented here. It is important to understand the genre of JP2's reflection correctly. He doesn't speak about Europe as a professor of history, philosophy, or sociology. He doesn't even speak as a professor of theology. He doesn't try to be, you know, Josef Ratzinger before Josef Ratzinger became Benedict XVI. He really places himself in the position of the successor of Peter, who wants to tell us in a prophetic way what the Catholic Church should say to the peoples of Europe. I, Bishop of Rome and Shepherd of the Universal Church from Santiago, utter to you Europe of the ages. As, let's say, an institutional witness, John Paul II tries to articulate what the experience of the Catholic Church, taking it into account two millennia of her history, may have to offer to the understanding of European identity. He understands himself as a kind of spokesperson for the whole community, taking into account the centuries of its existence of the Catholic Church. Many would describe such an approach today in the secular world as impossible, and pathetic. But this is only proof that in our individualistically oriented world, we are losing the understanding and experience of the role of community. In the case of the Catholic Church, these understandings and experiences are absolutely crucial. Without them, the Catholic Church cannot exist. Even though we may admit the special genre of JP2's reflection, the message on Europe by John Paul II may still seem too simplistic and arrogant to us. Does it sufficiently take into account the other sources of European identity? Isn't it too pushy 
emphasizing the role of Christ to such an extent that the other religions have hardly any place in a reflection on the identity of Europe. It seems that in the contemporary Catholic Church, the Church of, for example, the Abu Dhabi document on human fraternity, or the last Fratelli Tutti, there is no place for such a strong overemphasizing of her own identity. Well, in reaction to such an argument, one might try to explain that it is absolutely normal that the successor of Peter, the institutional witness, should want to present the identity of Europe from within his intra-religious perspective, without taking into account all its complexities. Anyway, both the above-mentioned above observations, although in a special way the second one, lead me to the next part. The answer to the doubts raised concerning the right understanding of John Paul II's project for Europe is given, is given not so much by the content itself of this proposal, it may be used, unfortunately, in an arrogant way, full of hubris. The real answer was given by the way he himself tried to put his thinking into practice, his tactics of helping the people of Europe, and not only of Europe, in their efforts to be themselves again. So I'm coming to the, to the second part of, of my presentation, the way of preaching the message. The touch of the Polish Pope in putting into practice the main claim of his pontificate, man cannot be fully understood without Christ, had a couple of hallmarks that are decisive for its deeply Christian relevance. Although John Paul II was strongly and unequivocally convinced about the absolute relevance of Christ for human history, his claim for that was never presented and developed with disrespect for the convictions and choices of others. In the programmatic encyclical for his pontificate, Redemptor Homilies, so we are coming back once, once more to it, to this text, he wrote, the missionary attitude always begins with a feeling of deep esteem for what is in man, for what man has himself worked out in the depths of his spirit concerning the most profound and important problems. It is a question of respecting everything that has been brought about in him by the spirit, which blows where it wills. The mission is never distraction, but instead is a taking up and fresh building, even if in practice, there has not always been full correspondence with this high ideal. So 1979. One can find hundreds of examples of this attitude in the pontificate of John Paul II, the Christmas and Easter addresses in which he made up to the end of his life, a great effort in order to say a few words of greetings and wishes in dozens of languages, a big part of them the most forgotten ones. The meetings with the, meetings with the heads of the other world religions or the leaders of other countries, sometimes hostile to Catholicism. He had the gift of approaching all with great respect without compromising the strength of the message he felt obliged to deliver. A very interesting example of this attitude was his famous speech in the headquarters of UNESCO on the 2nd of June, 1980. After having explained that Christianity has a special openness to and interest in culture because of its strong support for the transcendence of the person, which is rooted in the message of Christ. And thus, after having tried to evangelize the representatives of UNESCO, he continued, ladies and gentlemen, you will kindly forgive my making this statement. Proposing it, I didn't want to offend anyone at all. I beg you to understand that in the name of what I am, 
I could not abstain from giving this testimony. It also bears within it this truth, which cannot be passed over in silence on culture, if we seek in it everything that is human, the elements in which man expresses himself or through which he wants to be the subject of his existence. Thus, he, he attempts to say, sorry, that you may think that I'm trying to convert you. But firstly, treat it please as my testimony. And secondly, try to notice that there is an objective anthropological basis for making such a claim. <laughs> All this had to let, sorry, have to lead John Paul II to a reflection on the relevance of dialogue in human relationships. In his encyclical Ut Unum Sint, following the ideas of the philosophy of dialogue developed in the 20th, 20th century, mainly by the Jewish thinkers, Martin Buber, Franz Rosenzweig, and Emmanuel Levinas, he concisely presented its breathtaking description. The capacity for dialogue is rooted in the nature of the person and his dignity. As seen by philosophy, this approach is linked to the Christian truth concerning man as expressed by the Council, Vatican II. Man is in fact the only creature on earth which God willed for itself. Thus he cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Dialogue is an indispensable step along the path towards human self-realization, the self-realization both of each individual and of every human community. Although the concept of dialogue might appear to give priority to the cognitive dimension, dialogos, all dialogue implies a global existential dimension. Dialogue is not simply an exchange of ideas. In some way, it is always an exchange of gifts. The Eucharistic idea of dialogue, because we should find it in this text here, as containing in itself an existential dimension and understood as exchange of gifts and not only exchange of ideas, fitted the ecumenical movement very well and the encounters between the different Christian churches. But JP2's description even though presented in the encyclical on ecumenism, was much more universal. In fact, he recognized dialogue as a part of each interreligious encounter too. So my last long quote, and we will stop with the text by JP2 with this quote. Interreligious dialogue is a part of the church's evangelizing mission. Understood as a method and means of mutual knowledge and enrichment, dialogue is not in opposition to the mission at Gentes. Indeed, it has special links with that mission and is one of its expressions. This mission, in fact, is addressed to those who do not know Christ and his gospel and who belong for the most part to other religions. In Christ, God calls all peoples to himself, and he wishes to share with them the fullness of his revelation and love. He doesn't fail to make himself present in many ways, not only to individuals, but also to entire peoples, though their, through, through their spiritual riches, of which their religions are the main and essential expression, even when they contain gaps, insufficiencies, and errors." End quote. In this context, John Paul II will insist that mission and dialogue, quote, must maintain both their intimate connection and their distinctiveness. Therefore, they should not be confused, manipulated, or regarded as identical, as though they were interchangeable, interchangeable, end quote. In other words, mission and dialogue, only both together, intimately connected, may represent the right Christian attitude to the world 
of non-believers to the world of the other. But all that I have said up to now would not be sufficiently convincing as an answer to my doubts raised just before we started the reflections of the second part. Without the final aspect of JP2's attitude in preaching the absolute relevance of Christ for all of human identity and history, the history and identity of Europe concluded. John Paul II's insistence on the necessity of the conversion of Christians is not only one more important element that we should take into account when thinking about JP2's spiritual strategy. It is in the end, its source of transformative dynamism and an utmost proof that the Polish Pope was not looking in his reflection on the identities of peoples and of Europe, for a flat, pragmatic influence and success, but that rather he wanted his mission to be spiritually and intellectually honest, honest to God, honest to men and women. The idea of asking for forgiveness for the errors of the Catholic Church over the last millennium was connected with the Jubilee year 2000. The step undertaken in land 2000 was carefully prepared by earlier reflection and work. In a moving ceremony, the 79 year old John Paul II recognized before God the sins of the community of the church, inter alia religious intolerance and injustice toward Jews, women, indigenous peoples, immigrants, the poor, and the unborn. It was for sure one of the most powerful and groundbreaking, groundbreaking gestures in the pontificate of John Paul II. Well, let's stop here this short and rough sur survey of the main hallmarks, tactical elements of the core strategy adopted by John Paul II. It is not comprehensive for sure, but it is sufficient in order to formulate the main claim of my presentation. So as you understand, we are coming to the, to the third, to the last, last part now. John Paul II's proposal for Europe was the invitation to rediscover its strong Christian identity. But the way in which the Polish Pope tried to put this proposal into practice showed that it will be a rediscovery of the truly Christian identity only if it's combined with respect for the other, interest in dialogue, and capacity for self-questioning, recognizing one's own failures, weaknesses, and injustices. Such an attitude allowed JP2 to make a warm place for the other inside of his own religious tradition. It seems of great importance for me that this warm place, respectful and full of interest for the other inside of the Christian tradition should be made not in spite of a strong Christian identity, but only because of it. Well, it may seem quite obvious for many of us. I hope that it is. In the end, it is just a purely Christian proposal rooted in the gospel that has been articulated many times in the different centuries by Christian thinkers and leaders. Nevertheless, let's be honest, the Catholic Church needed the Second Vatican Council to present its own identity in the relationship to the others with such a respectful clarity. Such an understanding of religious identity and its role in creating a warm place for the other should be of great importance in contemporary Europe and in the contemporary world. 
The contemporary dominant project for Europe articulated by the institutions of the European Union, mainly, not only, wants to bring the peoples of this continent in another direction. Its guidelines have been given by the Enlightenment. Let's sum up its agenda in the religious area with two elements of crucial importance. The hegemony of reason, the re religiously naked public square. It is reason and objective rationality that should decide about the value of all the areas of our activities, religion included. Kant's religion, re religion within the boundaries of mere reason set the tone for this enlightened transformation of the religious sphere. As its obvious consequence, societies have had to arrive at some point in their development at the conviction that A, traditional religions are a strictly individual business, and B, the common public square should be stripped of all religious imagery and symbolism. It has had its plainest example in the Laïcité à la Française, which after having transformed France has been exported to other countries inside and outside of Europe. What seems important to me in the context of my argument is that both the above mentioned elements of the contemporary European project are connected with the logic of containment in the religious sphere. Religion may have its place in such a project only by cutting off everything that is not justifiable by reason. Only by reducing its influence to the private sphere may it be accepted. In such a way, we should arrive at a world of liberty, equality, and brotherhood, a world full of respect for the other. But the traditional religions, mainly Christianity and Judaism in Europe for centuries, are invited to make the journey inside of the enlightened project, not because of their identities, but in spite of them, cutting out and throwing away parts of what they have been for centuries. Needless to say, such a project could not work on the side of religion. Truncated identities do not attract followers. The churches that decided to undertake Kant's proposal are gradually disintegrating seeping out into a variety of common projects that make up the social fabric. On the other hand, we know that the enlightened project, undertaken with the desire to create a new kind of man, got stuck. Firstly, our bitter knowledge of the postmodern era requires us to recognize that reason is not something objectively verif verifiable and accountable. National so socialism and communism, two totalitarian experiences with objectively rational ideologies give us sufficiently extensive material in order to admit that reason becomes very dangerous if left on its own without any deeper religious foundation. Science, the hope of the last hour of modernity, after the discovery of the theory of relativity and the indeterminacy principle, has lost its proud conviction that however pragmatically successful it is, it may present to us a kind of objectively rational last word that may serve, us, uh, serve as the ultimate ground for our thinking. Hence, the postmodern questioning of reason should not be astonishing for us. Secondly, if we are really honest, uh, we should also recognize that our religiously, religiously naked public squares 
make our societies utterly vulnerable. Our societies, societies deprived of a religious background in their common imagination, become more and more deprived of the necessary energy to care for the common good, have children, defend themselves. The Enlightened Project, either in its modern or in its postmodern version, if we agree to understand the postmodern version as a controversial continuation of the Enlightenment, has not got the really energetic resources to get us, the peoples of Europe, out of our selfishness and individualism. It is because of all that we need to turn to the proposal articulated on behalf of the Catholic Church by John Paul II. We need to restart the struggle for safeguarding liberty, equality, and brotherhood with deep, respect, with deep respect for the other, not in spite of our religious identities, but because of them. I do not know whether all the religious, re religious communities have the resources to create a warm place for the other inside of their own religious identities. But Catholicism, interpreted by John Paul II in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, does for sure. Unfortunately, it is difficult to know whether it is not too late for such a correction in European societies. If it's not going to happen, what should we expect? Let me finish this part with an anecdote. I happen to be an admirer of classical music, especially classical music for the piano. One of the most famous piano masterpieces of all times is the Goldberg Variations by Johann Sebastian Bach. They have been recorded by some of the most outstanding pianists. To propose a new interpretation of them is like claiming to achieve an ultimate grasp of the European tradition of music for the piano. Recently, one of the most remarkable pianists of our times, Lang Lang, you may know this name, released a video promoting his new recording. On the one hand, there are photos from his recital in the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig with a very moving scene of his homage to Johann Sebastian Bach. He puts a rose on his tomb. On the other hand, there are the conversations and performances made by him in Beijing, recorded in a former Buddhist shrine. One should recognize that his performances presented in this video are absolutely awesome, awesome. I have to confess that putting aside for a moment the pleasure of listening to his exquisite performances, when looking at this video, I felt profoundly delighted and frightened at the same time. I felt delighted because it was so intriguing to see an outsider who could understand this core European piece of music so well and be able to refresh what we think about it with his great imagination and talent. But I also felt frightened because I'm not sure that we can expect him to be interested in and impressed by the fact that the structure of this work, playing a game with the number three, 30 variations organized in sets of three, of a composer who used to sign his manuscripts quite often with SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, Glory to God Alone, and who breathed theology is probably meant to represent the perfection of the triune God. And even if he himself were impress impressed by, by that, I'm not sure that we could expect that the million young pianists in the People's Republic of China 
lurking in the wings and trying to follow the example of Lang Lang are going to be impressed by this detail, even if Lang Lang might be. He decided to play in a Buddhist temple in the end. If the Europeans do not accept the invitation presented by John Paul II, if they are not strong in their religious identity, although converted and open to the other, one can expect that Europe we know will have to disappear within the next hundred years. Let's hope that it's not going to happen in another bloodbath, although today one may see more reasons for concern than optimism. All this leads me to my concluding remarks. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the life of Karol Wojtyla, John Paul II, seems to be entangled with the mystery of divine mercy. If I'm not, if I'm not wrong, and it really should be the main interpretative key of his pontificate, his proposal for Europe should be read while taking this into account. The devotion of the divine mercy came into being in the 20th century, in the second half of the 30s, just before the drama of the Second World War, and in the part of the world that was later hit by this cruel set of events in the most destructive way. It has a quite simple and powerful message at its center, a cry for divine pity for sinners, thanks to the passion and death of Christ. The core part of Sister Faustina's chaplet to the divine mercy reads as follows, eternal power, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Obviously, John Paul II's proposal for Europe is not a proposal of a form of piety, devotion, but it is a general pastoral strategy developed by a successor of Peter. Nevertheless, it has the same purpose, to bring the peoples of Europe to conversion, and lead them to discover the riches of the Paschal mystery of Christ. And its ardent fulfillment by the Polish Pope, entirely committed to, the, to his mission, gave it the passionate zeal of Faustina's message. Let's hope, let's pray, let's work hard together, that there may not be any similarity between the dramatic aftermath of Faustina's death and what may happen now and in the future in the aftermath of JP2's death. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Father Mikhail Paluk, for your inspiring lecture. Would you mind unsharing the screen, stop screen, screen sharing the yeah, yeah, please, please. questions, please? Dear audience, uh, please feel free to ask questions but Mikhail Palog is here with us for another 10 minutes. Please make use of the Q&A button. And if I may, I would start us with, with one question. Um, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's always inspiring to, to, to listen to John Paul II's uh, teachings. My question is this. The impression I get is that John Paul II wanted to remind Europe of its Christian roots and its Christian identity and invite Europeans to convert. So the European is a person who has forgotten his or her Christian roots and needs to rediscover those roots. But what about many people who would see themselves as Europeans who may have different religious backgrounds and very much believe that they belong to Europe? Lang Lang, I mean, he goes back to Beijing and, and, and uh, he, he doesn't intend to stay in Europe. But what about those who are not of Christian traditions and would very much like to shape Europe as a continent in the future. I, I would say that what I tried to present in my in my talk was 
um, just to make understand that that John Paul II tried develop his reflection, taking into account uh, his um, institutional role. And so, yep. so I would say uh, it, it seems to me the, the clue to, to understand this message. It's, and and uh, what seems important for me is his deep understanding of, uh, of the necessity of dialogue. Yeah. And, and, and of the place for, for the others. Nevertheless, I would say that, that he, he had this strong conviction that, that, that the only, um, so to say, the only clue to the mystery of, of man uh, has been given to humanity by, by Christ. So, well, the, you, can, you, you, you can say that, that it is, um, that, that his missionary um, attitude uh, might be understood as, as a little bit aggressive, arrogant, and, and so on. But if, if you take into account all the elements of, of, of his attitude, it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, understandable, I think. And, well, I would say what, what we can see is uh, people who, who really... Uh, you know, entered in the dialogue with John Paul II, uh, they appreciated his his strong identity. The, the problem that 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 uh, that we have today is, you know, we can we, we are quite often convinced that weakened identity is the solution for 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 becoming inclusive. I think that that it's it's quite the opposite we need. So you know, instead instead of 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 trying to weaken our identity, which 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 does if if we weaken our identity, we, we don't have the resources to uh, to create a warm place inside of our identity yeah. for, uh, for the other. And it's it's the opposite direction we need. So you know, we we need to to make our identity strong, but converted in the process of of of, of conversion in order. To, in order, you know, to have the warm place for the other inside of, of the religious tradition. Yeah, I'm not Thank sure, you. but but I'm, I'm I, I have answered the question. But but as you can see, I try to remain inside of this religious perspective yep. because because I think that it is it is clue to to understand John Paul II. Well, and you also made clear that it's legitimate to stay within this perspective. It's it's not something that should be excluded from the public sphere. I got a message from a student. Um, he wants to know how is your reading of John Paul II's role in bringing down communism in the year 1989 and the aftermath of what led to it? Yeah, it's, I think that, that it, it's very difficult to imagine uh, all this happen with an, without John Paul II. Mm -hmm. So let's, yep. let's, let's start with, 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 with a claim like this. And then if we are speaking, if we speak about, about such complex processes, it's, then it's it's very difficult to to articulate uh, all the actors because one, one might say that that without uh, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 quite uh, quite true. And and his strategies uh, in the eighties, it 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 might be very difficult to get to the point as well. So I I think that that there there are there are many many different factors that that played here. Mm, a, a very important role, but but Let me also ask you, the one. you know, Father Michael, a more personal question. You were born in 1967, so you were 22 in in 1989. Uh, how, how did you remember the events? You were in Poland at the time, so so what yeah. was your recollection? So well, I would say that that for somebody like me, it was something I, I didn't imagine to happen soon, and even mm -hmm. even my. My expectation was that, that perhaps I, I won't I won't leave something something like this in my in my own life. Perhaps it will finally happen in some some time in, in, in the future because because as we know uh, all the uh, empires start and and and, and finish at some, yeah. at some point. But but I would say that that after after having attended. Uh, the primary school and secondary school, 
in in a communist country, I, I didn't expect you know it it, it to happen so. On. Yeah, so so well so it was it was a, a, a you know something an emotion of, of 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 great joy but at the same time it 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 almost it it, it seemed almost un, unreal to some extent you know yeah that's fascinating before the panel uh, a person asked me to ask you um Pope Francis uh, talks in Fratelli Tutti about Europe and his disappointment with Europe, the shattered dream, you know, of being a unified as well as hospitable continent. Do you think that John Paul II would have shared this concern with Europe closing its borders? Well, I, well it's, it's, it's a question how to articulate uh, our problems and, and, you know, and as, as we understand each Pope has its his his own touch and he has his his right to have his own touch. I I should say that that I see a lot of continui continui continuity uh, between John Paul II and Benedict on on the one hand sure. and with Francis on the on the other hand. So so, so to to some extent, both of them uh, are articulated. You know the different parts of of, of of his approach of his pontificate. I think that that the place uh, of the poor from the beginning was, um, uh, you know, high priority uh, of the agenda of John Paul II. If you if you come back to this Redemptor Hominis, yep. you you will you will find there a very powerful image. Um, of uh, you know of the rich and Lazarus uh, expecting on 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 the threshold fre uh, threshold and, and 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 you know and John Paul II you uh, explains that it is the image of our world we mm. are so so I think that that he 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 was quite strong if we if we go back to 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 his discourses. Uh, about the rights of the poor, of of uh, of uh, having uh, a, an important place in, in in the political agendas and and in, in the world today. Thank you. A last question: uh, We had two non-Italian popes from Europe, one from Poland and one from Germany, most recently, and then now obviously a pope from Argentina. Do you think that the the Church's overall approach to Europe has changed because of that? I, well, I think that that uh, it, it it is what I, what I feel here uh, in Rome. We we are really moving to a much more internationalized uh, church just now. Uh, I think that 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 it uh, probably you can you can you can you cannot say that it 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 was John Paul II who started this uh, this agenda because. I think with Paul Sieg, uh, with Sieg uh, you can you can find some yep. some important moves in this direction. But it's true that that John Paul II made this agenda of making uh, the church really much more inter in, international. Uh, it, it was very visible, and then uh, with Benedict, but especially with Francis, th this effort is, is quite visible. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I think. Uh, uh, Francis tries to make the church um, uh, sometimes uh, much more surprising. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so you know, uh, go out a little bit of what we what we got used to 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 receive when we are speaking about uh, about the church. But but uh, thank you. That, yeah. We are at time. Father Mikael Paluk, thank you so much for an inspiring lecture. Thank you, thank you for very much our for questions. Having. Have a lovely dinner after this. I mean, you deserve a dinner in the evening in Rome. To you. Thank you, dear audience, for joining us. Thank you, Connor, for the technical support. And stay tuned, go Nanovic, and don't forget it's Notre Dame Day. Think of the Nanovic Institute. Thank you again, Father Mikael. Have thank a good you, evening. Bye bye now. Have thank you. Bye bye.